So Tim and I have some friends who have two boys that are very close together in age. They're just 13 months apart. And she and I had our first babies together. And so when she announced just three months after our first ones were born that she was pregnant again, I was, to say the least, a little in awe. And uh, I remember visiting with her shortly after her second one was born, and again in awe that someone had not one, but now two babies to care for at just 13 months apart. And I'll never forget what she said to me. She said, you know, my husband and I planned this. She said, we really wanted to have our kids close together in age so we could just get back to normal. <laughs> so even if you're not a parent, you think that's funny. If you are a parent, that's hilarious. <laughs> because nobody ever gets back to normal after having even just one child. Nothing is ever normal again. If you have two kids, I don't care how close together they are, your next shot at normal is like 19 years out. <laughs> it's just not going to happen. Now this was a really big, long reading that Marie gave us this morning with a lot in it. Probably four different topics that we could choose to tackle this morning. And I invite you to go home and unpack it yourselves. It's a really wonderful reading. But one of the things that strikes me the most about it is that Peter is trying to get back to normal. This is exactly what he's doing. He had just made it through a pretty incredibly tumultuous time that included all the events and the travels and the ministry leading up to the Last Supper. It included the trial and the sentencing of Jesus by Pontius Pilate. It included Peter's own denial that he even knew Jesus. It included the crucifixion, the empty tomb, the appearance of Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, to the disciples, not once, but twice. It was a whirlwind of a time in their lives. And Peter's head must have been spinning. It must have been, because I don't know how else to explain the fact that he says, well, I think I'll go fishing. <laughs> like that was the most normal thing to do. And while taking back some semblance of routine and normalcy is important when we're facing great loss, to expect anything to be normal again is delusional, <laughs> especially for Peter and his disciples. Nothing would ever be ordinary for them. Nothing will ever be ordinary for us. The ascension of Jesus means that the disciples have to completely re-examine what it means to be a disciple. Everything they thought about discipleship changed the minute that Jesus was resurrected. Jesus upped the ante. Before the crucifixion, the disciples were learning at the feet of the rabbi. They were getting intimate instruction on some of life's biggest questions. They were being taught by example how to live a life of obedience and faith, how to live with integrity and honor and in relationship to God. Before the crucifixion, they were kind of like bodyguards, making sure Jesus didn't get stoned to death. They were like his assistants, traveling ahead of him to prepare the way. But after the resurrection, they were in charge. It was a defining moment in monumental ways, including the fact that the disciples now had to be willing to step into leadership. Sometimes people are thrust into leadership reluctantly or unexpectedly, and I'm sure you can probably think of myriad examples in your own life where that is true. A lot of things come to mind, including Lyndon Johnson when JFK was assassinated, teen mothers, assistant pastors. We get thrust into moments of needing to lead. And the most successful reluctant leaders are those who force themselves to embrace the fact that while this is not the destiny they may have chosen, it's a duty and they will follow it to the end. 
You know, I have to think we wouldn't even be here today if those 12 disciples had not followed it to the end. They embraced that leadership, even if it came after they thought, we should just get back to normal. See, Jesus added one caveat for the disciples, too. He said, follow this to the end, but follow it to the end in love. Jesus was no longer going to be walking around with them physically. And so the challenge before them was, how do we continue to experience Jesus' presence and carry his work forward for him? And we get a clue in the next part of the passage. Jesus asks Peter, do you love me? Three times Jesus asks this, and three times Peter says yes. Well, twice Peter says yes. The third time he's a little, got his feelings hurt a little bit, I think, because he turns to Jesus and he says, Jesus, you know everything. You know that I love you. And with each answer, Jesus replies to Peter, feed my lambs, tend my sheep, feed my sheep. And then he ends with a simple call, follow me. Follow me, because your professions of faith alone are not enough. If you are my disciples, if you want to carry my work forward, if you want to know me, your words of love must be matched by a life of love. Your words of love must be put into action, Jesus says. And... Jesus says to Peter, by the way, you're not going to like where this leads. See, Jesus foreshadows the death that Peter will eventually endure. A death on the cross, much like Jesus, although in some ways more horrific, because tradition holds that Peter refused to be crucified in the same way as Jesus, so he asked to be hung upside down on the cross. So Jesus has just asked Peter to lay down his life in love. And prior to this very moment, on a beach with friends around a campfire, Peter was not likely to have committed to that. He wasn't ready yet. He wasn't ready yet, but the resurrection changed all of that. It elevated the expectations of the disciples, but it also elevated what they were capable of. Do you ever feel that way? That God equips you for the task at hand? That if God leads you to it, God will lead you through it? In Paul's letter to Ephesians, he says, God equips each of us for service. Now, martyrdom is one way to serve, but thankfully it's not the only way. Not all discipleship is marked by a physical death. Christians everywhere exhibit what it means to lay down one's life in love. Mother Teresa did it. Martin Luther King Jr. did it. Priests and nuns and clergy everywhere do it. Doctors and nurses without borders do it. Our military personnel do it when they're sent on deployment for long stretches and their families do it when they're left behind. Moms and dads do it every single day of every minute of every single day. And what I'm talking about is a sacrificial witness to love. Dying to self in order to bring the kingdom to life. Peter was a fisherman, but Jesus asked him to be a shepherd. God elevated him to do something that he'd never envisioned for himself before. And it's easy for me to take these verses of scripture about feeding the lambs and think that they were just intended to place authority on Peter. I mean, after all, Jesus had already said, you are my rock, and on this rock I will build my church. So it's easy for me to think, oh, Peter, that's a big job you have there. But what would it look like if these verses went something like this? Sharla, daughter of Charles and Pat, do you love me more than anything? Feed my lambs. Sharla, do you love me? Tend my sheep. Sharla, do you love me? Feed my sheep. It's a little different to hear it that way. 
You see, if we're here in this place this morning, because we profess to be followers of Christ, and I believe we are, then our words of love are not enough. Our love needs to be put into action. Feed my sheep. And here's the thing. Some of those sheep are dysfunctional little lambs. <laughs> they are prone to wandering, and they are likely to be caught playing with wolves. And Jesus says, feed them anyway. There's a pretty straightforward and, and commonly agreed upon life plan that most people ascribe to, including me, and it goes something like this. Go to college, get a good job, get married, have a few kids, maintain some semblance of financial security, buy a few nice things, Raise wildly successful children who will someday move out of the house and maybe get their own car insurance. <laughs> you know, we pursue our dream with a zeal. And I, for one, do thank God daily for all that I have. But those are just words. What if we took seriously God's call to action, the call to care for God's sheep in all their dysfunctional messiness? not doing more of what you're already really good at, forgetting about that clean little life plan that we've pursued, but changing it up altogether. You know, I confess that I did not know that there are more than 2,000 scriptures in the Bible that deal with things like oppression and poverty and justice for one another. 2,000 scriptures speak to that. What Bible are we reading when we think that the entirety of Scripture was inspired by God to just bless us a little more than we've been blessed? <clears throat> we are called to care for one another. What if God, what if what God is really saying through his Scriptures, and I'm going to quote the brilliant writer Jen Hapmaker here, what if God is really saying to us, my people are crumbling, dying, and starving, and you're blessing blessed people and serving the saved. What if he's calling us to think about that? He's relying on us to witness to the world with the entirety of our being, all we are, all we have, and all we, we will become. Do you know that that is Snowmass Chapel's mission? to love the Lord our God with all we have, all we are, and all we will become. God is counting on us. You know those bracelets that we used to wear? They were so popular for a while. WWJD stands for, what would Jesus do? Well, I have a new one I'm proposing. WWID, what will I do? It's not just enough to say, what would Jesus do? What will I do? There's a lot to be done. And like the disciples, we get to experience Jesus' presence by carrying out his work. It's a privilege. Jesus said to Peter in Matthew 16, you are Peter and on this rock I will build my foundation. If Peter was ascribed authority over the church for any reason, let it be this, because his love for Jesus was so great that he modeled for the rest of eternity how to shepherd the sheep. Each new time that Jesus appeared to people after the resurrection, people were moved to actively join his cause. A change came over them. The Jesus movement, which began with his ministry, seemed to end with his death on a cross, but it actually took off and spread at a supernatural pace because of the zeal and enthusiasm of the people who had been changed because of their encounter with Christ. They were elevated to a new way of being. Their response to the question, do you love me, was to show Jesus how great their love was not tell him. Shepherd the sheep. Greater love hath no man than this, 
than to lay down your life for a friend. So how will you shepherd the sheep?